All right, Jamie Arbaba. First off, I'd like to thank you. All right, Jamie Arbaba again. Jamie Arbaba. Where's Steve Barry? Barry. I was going to thank him for coming. Anyway, when you thank the LA group for coming, although some of them have to use it, I haven't done anything that I've done in some of them. I want to thank uh, Deborah, particularly, I want to thank the Congress. Anyway, to those who were here, I just give the briefest recap of Holy Foods. But before I do that, I've, on April 8th, 2014, um, particular instructions from John Foreman from Nashville to read a couple things. This is from uh, Adi K. Rani. And our friend Steve Berry has promised to write a, a story of Adi's passing because he was there. And I have promised along with Lynn Berry to help him edit his writing. Adi said this, After proximity to his physical being and proximity to his mind, the next in importance is going to his samadhi within the first hundred years. Baba built his tomb so many years before he dropped his body. He gave constant instructions to his mandali that wherever he dropped his body, it must be interned in this tomb. He did this for us. He did this to give important benefit to us. Mayor Baba has left a sort of machinery at his tomb. His heat is a small heart. His heart is the universal heart. My heat is a small heart. His heart is the universal heart. When I go to the tomb, with the effects of the commissions and omissions of my life's actions, I carry impure blood. This is poured into the machinery of his universal heart. He draws it in, turns it, purifies it, and gives it back. When he gives it back, the pure blood he takes a little bit for his universal work, and most of it he gives back to you. The tomb is a source of purification. This is of great importance to us. Going to Baba's tomb will help you hold on to his dhamma. Never miss an opportunity to go to the Baba's tomb. Wow, um, thank you. Now, um, John also, in the, this, John Foreman, in the spirit of enthusiasm, gave me this poem, and I'm going to hand out, I have 25 of them, I don't know how many will be here. Uh, it says it was written in July of 79, in fact it was written in May. I was in, at Myrtle Beach when Adi was there for the last time in May of 79, I was there for three weeks, and before every one of his talks, he would give this poem. And I carried a copy of this in my wallet for about 20 years till it actually disintegrated, and for some reason never rewrote it. So I'm going to carry it continuously here. But Adi K would read this to us. Beloved Mayor Baba, bless us all, so that in the stress and strain of our daily life and the fluctuations of our mind, we learn to relax wholly and wholeheartedly and float on the ocean of your love and call forth your breath of joy your breeze of compassion, your wind of strength, could flood into every fiber of our body, every corner of our mind, and every space of our heart, to cleanse us of all impurity, to make us worthy of your love, of your obedience, of your service, and above all, your pleasure. I need to Wow. So I'm going to hand these out. You're all welcome. Thank you. To have one of these. I made 25. I don't know how many people will be here. Um, I'm going to talk uh, up to the last 15 minutes about Holy Foods, and then I'm going to tell you a personal experience I had, um, which I regard as the most important experience. Thank you. Um, I just want to say, because we started by putting a place, just you know, trying to have a vision of what it's going to be like. Yes. And it's like anyway. For those of you who were not here, and those who were here, like Dinah, who forgot she was here. No, it was six months ago. Oh. Anyway, irrespective of that, we'll continue. Um, Holy Foods was the first large-scale natural food store in Berkeley. And um, I had four partners, three were active and one was a benefactor. And I owned it for seven years. By the end, I was a salt owner. And we were the second, by the end, the second largest natural food store in Northern California and therefore probably in the country. Um, and in the course of that, just to give you mere statistics, because I get Bob in the windows, it was the fourth largest intersection in Berkeley. 
I conservatively estimated 40 million people saw Baba's image. Wow. And 700,000 customers came in and saw Baba's image. Esther Madison lived up there at that time, she's here now. And we gave away 100,000 Baba cards, which I got from there, Baba information, and 30,000 of highest of the high and uh, got in the pill. One of the most important aspects of owning Holy Foods was doing the drug work, which Baba regarded as paramount, as you recall, from the early 70s and late 60s. So those are the raw statistics of uh, Holy Foods. The way it came into being uh, was that numerous persons from what was called the Arbor Cafe, which was owned by two bottle lovers, Ed Van Buskirk and Dennis Alessia, uh, decided, because it was no natural food store in Berkeley, to open this store. We had no money, we had a few dollars amongst us, and I found a benefactor. I advertised in the Arbor Cafe, and this fellow named Botan Varga, who was a refugee, he and his brother Peter were refugees from the 1956 Hungarian Revolution against the Communists. He came in, and he agreed to pony up dollar for dollar. The only condition was, was as I mentioned before, is that I had to drive to a certain street at a certain time, at a certain night in Berkeley, and his lawyer, I would roll down the window, his lawyer would hand me an envelope of money, and I was not to ask questions. What I forgot to mention last time, what was certainly implied, was what I didn't know, and this is why Holy Foods came into being, and this is the avatar, this is unbelievably Mayor Baba, that money was, Botan was the biggest marijuana dealer in Berkeley. Oh, no. He, he, he had truckloads of marijuana being driven in from, from Mexico, and as a consequence, I didn't know that, because I never would have taken the money. So this is the avatar. He shields us from the obvious in order to do his work. But there's a good side to this. Botan did end up getting busted at that time, and he went to jail. But he also, he also um, financed the first ecology center in the United States in Berkeley, and also my friend Bob Gurner store, which was called Westbury Natural Foods. And I did mention Bob at the end of the last talk as one of the most deeply moving experiences of my life, and you'll have to either see the DVD or remember what I said about that, because I can't recap everything. But Botan went to jail for a couple years, and when he, I wanted to say this about it because I talked about my other partners. I and mean, when he came out of jail, all he wanted was his money back, which was interesting. He didn't want any interest. And he, he, he got married, so the next time I saw him, he was married to his lady named Susan. Botan was like my size, but he was more muscular. And Susan was tall and thin. It was really interesting. And she was a, an attorney. And she was very sympathetic to Baba. And Botan was an atheist. But because I treated him with love, and he had never really gotten love in his life, I felt, he began to open up to Baba. And I wanted to say that over the course of the years, I would see him in 35 years. But over the course of the next few years, when he would shop in the store, I'd give him a discount, which was inspirational probably too. He, um, he began to like listen to what Baba had to say, and he began to become more loving soul. So I wanted to tip my hat to this person, who meant a lot. Anyway, I wanted to talk about some of the people I forgot last time, the employees or Baba people. And first I want to talk about this lady, Patty Johnson, later Patty McCoy. She lives in Clarksdale, Mississippi now. And Patty was a jewel, and she laughs at everything. Usually I say, oh, Patty, and she goes, oh, Helen, and I go, oh, Patty. That's our relationship. And she used to live down in, here in L.A. Her dad worked at Knott's Berry Farm. I think he was the general manager. And uh, she married a fellow who worked for me named Bill McCoy, who's passed since. And it, they became chiropractors. At one point in 73, I had hair down in my body and beard down to the middle of my chest, and Patty actually cut my hair and beard one night at her apartment. It was quite a moment. Uh, and so after that, I had shorter hair, but uh, I hadn't cut my hair in about five years at that point. Yes. Patty was a wonderful person, and um, she actually started the Blues Festival in Clarksdale, which is the home of the Blues. Robert Johnson was from Clarksdale about 25 years ago. And those of you who know David Miatke, uh, a musician from my area, his daughter Sarah, who's like my goddaughter, goes to Ole Miss for some reason. And Patty's taken her under her wing and takes her to blues clubs and stuff like that. So I want to tell Patty um, 
Jay Bobby for that. Um, now, I had a manager for about a year. His name was James Taylor. James lived, not the musician, James lived with Rick Chapman and Billy Ward, who lives in India now, at the box. It was an actual box, I should tell you, a lot of information. And James worked for me for about a year. And he lives in Washington, he's a Sufi now. He was one of my closest friends until all the law came with, between Sufism and others. And uh, he married Char Sharon Overton, David's ex-wife. So he doesn't have to work again, but he's, um, he's, a, he's a writer and he's now become a little bit of an actor in Sufism. And um, he's quite enjoy I sent him a tape of the first talk and it reminded him of many things. Um, but he reminded me of a good story at one point early on, he was my manager for about a year in the beginning, and these country hippies came in, like big guys, and we had um, I, we had like uh, aprons, it said Holy Foods on there, red and green, and um, in there we would have like pens and stuff like that. And I always had my box cover. You would call from my friend Betty, she always said I had my perennial box cover. Also, I had a uh, a price for it over my right. It was like a gunslinger, you know, from the old west. And um, I could price it at any given moment. And uh, so these guys came in, and we were just kind of getting started, and they said, we want food. It was kind of easy. You got food, we want food. There were about five of them. And so I lined my boys up behind me, uh, and I had big Arthur there. Arthur was like that, the big burly guy who had been our carpenter. So it was kind of a standoff at OK Corral. Mind me when I was a kid, you know, in the cowboy movies. And I'm looking around and thinking, like, well, who's going to be the spokesperson for us? And I look back, and they all step back the foot, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, showing all the courage of having a box cutter in your apron, I moved forward and said, if you guys want some food, you can take leftovers. And they went, we want all, and I started enumerating all the food they want, free food they wanted. We had no money, and nor should we have free food, particularly again at that point at least. So I backed them off. It was one of the great moments. I resurrected my cowboy experience as a child. Never became a cowboy, but I backed off about five country hippies with the, you know, like that kind of thing. Oscar guys that come from up the earth. Um, so that James reminded me of that. Well, how did you win? Yeah, what was the turning point? I think I came in a little, you know, the usual combination, life being what it is. You are an attorney. <laughs> Early on, I just, it's good to accommodate the neighborhood, you know. Remember, I told you last time I dealt with the Black Panthers and the Black Muslims. Yeah, I learned how to deal with the situation as it arises yeah, in Philadelphia. Did they get any food? Yeah, we gave them some food, yeah, just, but not as much as they had hoped. Do you eat food every week? No, that was, a one, that was a one time deal. The Panthers got it regularly, but they, these guys are country. They just come in for the free food. Um, I had an employee who was not a bottle lover, but I think it's really important I mention her. Her name was Shannon Ty, and she was uh, hired as a bookkeeper, and she became my girlfriend for a while. Um, and I would say, but for her, and I want to say this because she's going to see this DVD, you sent her the last one. Uh, I don't think Holy Foods would have made it through. She always encouraged me, uh, supported me emotionally, and had confidence in me. And, you know, I was not always clear what to do next. You know, Mayor Bob had come to me, as I mentioned in the prior talk, but he didn't give me the details. And he didn't tell me how much to buy, and he didn't tell me how to buy it. I mean, I had to do these details myself. But Shannon had great faith in me, and uh, she actually told it would say she has her own business in North Oakland. It was the first of a kind, and she's had it for 30 years. It's called I felt about face and body. It's a kind of a, a woman's uh, place where they look more beautiful. And I told her never underestimate the vanity of women, and she said that's right. And she's been successful because of that. And she said I was her mentor, but I always thought she was my teacher. To be honest with you, I learned a lot more from her and her good judgment and sensitivity than I suspect I ever gave her. Um, she liked Baba. She probably loved Baba in her own way, I suspect, but uh, it was not meant to be. But I want to thank her very much, because she'll see this DVD. DVD. Uh, another uh, employee that uh, I forgot she worked for me was a woman named Ellen Evans. And she's a Sufi, and she spent about a year bagging nuts and fruit up in the office. And Ellen is the president and principal of the mayor's school, the White Pony Schools. So if you see her today, She's the most professional-looking person imaginable. 
But I knew her back in the hippie days when she was chasing chickens and stuff like that. I was, I was a little more uh, down to earth than she is now. And Ellen has a great giggle, so I'm sure we had a wonderful time together. She reminded me of this marijuana that she worked for me, and I, I wanted to thank her very much. I hope I haven't forgotten any of the Baba people that work for me, but we were just in Myrtle Beach, and there's a woman named Debbie Ramsey there, and she said she worked for me for quite a while, but she was a volunteer. She was only 18, and she was Eddie Hauser's uh, girlfriend. Eddie, we, Karen and I saw Eddie and his wife Deborah while we were there, and I think uh, Deborah Ramsey for working me as a volunteer because you can't be volunteers when you have no money. So I want to thank Deborah because she makes this DVD too. And she giggles at everything as well. So I think I've hit all the employees who are Baba people that I can remember. And I hope I haven't forgotten any. If I forgot to mention Jack Mormon, he worked for me many years. He was my closest friend. And his then wife, Becky Stowes, she worked for me for many years. And, um, you know, I think I've gotten them all. And I'll thank every one of the Baba people. And I'll tell you my opinion at the conclusion as to my thinking about Baba people working for you. But right now, I want to thank them all, and if I forgot anyone, <laughs> forgive me. I truly hope they don't find out. <laughs> and Georgiana has moved up to um, Northern California now, and um, she was, and Sarah Dwyer lives in Northern California, but they both work for me, as you know. Um, this is a funny story. Baba's drug work was really important. You remember all that in the early 70s. And so we had these organic merchant meetings. And I asked Alan Cohen, who was my good friend. Alan lived up the street, and I'd see him two, three times a week. We would shop, or we'd hang out. If he wanted to give a talk at an organic merchants meeting, it was in April of 1969, even before we opened. It was down in Santa Cruz. And I asked Fred Rowe, the head of organic merchants, who's the hero of the natural food business, the organic food business in the United States, if it would be okay if I just brought someone to talk. And Fred said, why not? But he didn't know what I was going to add. But Alan was out of town, so Ira Dietrich, who's the president now of Sufism, uh, and is a lawyer, agreed to talk on drugs. So Ira and I drove down to Santa Cruz, and I remember this very vividly. There was a little hill, and there was all these hippies who were starting the organic food movement in the United States on the lawn. And Fred introduced me, and I introduced Ira. And I introduced Ira by saying, Ira's going to talk about the importance of not using drugs to these hippies, 60 hippies. Ah. And Ira's an utterly straight person. And um, so for 45 minutes or so, Ira talked about Mayor Baba's message of not using drugs. This is one of the more, and I sat there next to him and watched the faces of my friends and future friends as the drug message was being propounded. And it was really interesting, even if they didn't follow it, that they hear that. And later, uh, Fred wrote articles on uh, the sugar story and the oil story, which I mentioned last time about what kind of, never to use sugar and not to use certain kind of oils. I wrote the drug story, using Baba's words, kind of from God and pill and that kind of thing, and tried to get it going. And I handed it out in my store, and I probably gave away, I'm sure, thousands of them. That was the primary work of this, Holy Foods, you know, um, giving people an alternative to taking drugs. So I'm, as I'm sitting here, I'm seeing the faces of these 23-year-old hippies as Ira, he's, he can be rather strong-willed, preaching to them about the detriment of taking drugs, which was Baba's work, you know, spiritually, mentally, and physically, it was a danger. Um, oh, there was this group I mentioned last time called the One World Family, and it was uh, headed by this one, Cosmic Messiah, Alan Noonan. I, I mean, that's what he called himself. So there was a little competition between Alan Noonan and Mayor Baba, because there's only room for one Cosmic Messiah, really speaking. But I became uh, boyfriends with this woman named Patrice, who dropped out because of the drug thing. But it was terrible. They had a Marin County um, house as well, and the kids as early as 10 were using drugs. And it greatly upset me. Uh, I asked Alan Cohen if he could talk to this group. And there was like 100 people. They had a restaurant and a large commune in Berkeley. They had a fraternity house, and so you'd have a lot of people in a fraternity house. So I got to go. They were part of Organic Merchants, and 
One night, Alan and I moseyed our way over to, I didn't need this, but thank you. The first street. So Alan and I moseyed our way over to the One World family uh, commune. It was like, and of course Alan Newton is the boss, so they all were there. And Cohen and he had one of the most interesting debates about the use of drugs. It went on for a couple hours. And um, I was kind of laughing inside. I think Alan was still wondering, like, admit, these people are so drugged out, is this making any impression? <laughs> yeah. But at the end of it, it was really interesting. Alan Noonan sat there and listened to Alan Cohen, who's a very entertaining person, as you know, you had him here a few weeks ago. But it was serious. And at the end, Alan Noonan said, that let's hold hands and do ohm, you know, like, big circles, so it's all these people. So I looked at Cohen and he looked at me and we said, look, what the hell, we'll do it. And uh, so we did. And then we left and I said, hey, I used to call him, and I said, hey, that was um, quite interesting experiences. No, it's good we do that, did that, he said, because, you know, maybe it'll make some impression on them. But what broke my heart was seeing 10-year-old kids smoking pot. That infuriated me. Because I knew, and we know, and we knew then, how dangerous it was to these young people. So I felt these people were part of Berkeley, and they had a big restaurant on Telegraph Avenue up near campus, that any impression we could make to diminish the drug use was, was really important. And I wanted to go to the source. He was the source. He was the boss. Well, the commune still continues. I Googled it recently, and it was still there. He has passed, apparently. He wasn't there anymore. And somebody else is the boss. I don't know how that worked. <clears throat> you know, in the early 70s, late 60s, although this isn't specifically about Mayor Baba, but I think it's important, as we recall, there arose a lot of movements. There was the Black Power Movement, obviously, grew in the 60s and 70s. And I talked about the Panthers and the Muslims, which I had daily contact with, virtually. But also there was... Two other movements I thought really arose in Berkeley and to some degree in San Francisco, the gay movement and the women's liberation movement. And I saw this right in my store. I mean, Holy Foods was ground zero for everything in the country. It was like the vanguard of just passing everything through because of who we were. Uh, my partner, Joel, was essentially gay and, uh, well, it was bisexual, but essentially gay. And I mentioned last time about the problems he caused, the way he treated the employees. Um, is an unusual person, I, that's the most I want to say. But he did take me to San Francisco and I met a lot of people who started the gay movement. And it was quite interesting, you know, hearing them talk about the problems they had suffered and uh, watching them go through their thing. My main competitor, although it was in his mind more than mine, was a guy named Vitamin Tom. He was on Clement Street in San Francisco. And Tom was older and he was. He was also gay, and uh, he always wanted to know how much I was doing per month, because he wanted to do more. <laughs> he was about in the early 40s, and he had a partner named Kenny, and I never knew, you know, this is before gay marriage, obviously, and I never knew that, well, I never knew gay people as far as I knew, but I certainly didn't know they had partners. And this was interesting to watch their affection for each other. And Kenny was quite brilliant. He was the head of the math department at Lowell High School, which is a theater the academic theater school for San Francisco, where no laureates come out of it, Supreme Court justices. So watching them, who were friends of mine, was quite interesting. Um, and um, so it really developed in me, and I think it, it developed in the Bay Area, which still exists, obviously, a certain sensitivity towards the suffering of other people, which I was completely ignorant of. Um, and of course, now it's more prevalent, this understanding. The women's movement was definitely ground zero in Berkeley and ground zero in my, in my business. And uh, that was just a fact. And most of my employees were women, and most of my best employees were women, frankly, and I began to depend upon them for their good judgment and sound judgment. Men can move boxes faster, usually, and carry heavier weights, generally, but women seem to have a certain sensitivity towards customers, perhaps the guys don't have in the same way. But I also took the attitude that if a woman wanted to take a heavy lifting job, I wasn't going to prevent them 
Remember, we're in our 20s. We're not in our 60s at this point. We're barely any of us could do this stuff. So I had this woman um, in my who worked for me, Chrissy, who was a jewel. She was a white river raft expert as well. She would do that for us. She said, I want to be the produce manager. I said, done. And she would lift all those heavy crates and boxes. And as long as she could do it without complaining, it was fine by me. And, she, you know, and I enjoyed watching her do it. I had done it, so I know how heavy it was and how laborious it was. So, as I mentioned earlier about my friend Shannon, uh, I began to depend more and more on the women for business model as it evolved, because I thought they had better sense of that in some ways. Not that I didn't listen to the guys, because they know how to complain quite well. Yes. Uh, but you women know that. Um, now, as, as Holy Foods evolved, I, I began to sense that this was a piece of art in some ways. I'm not particularly artistic, but every time we would open in the morning, I'd always sing another opening, another show, because God knows what was going to happen that day. I would open the doors and there would be 20 people there, and they'd come pouring in. Some of them would come two, three times a day just for the action. It was a scene. I mean, it was a total scene. And the colors bob up there. Um, so I tried to develop a sensitivity towards you know, how to put out the produce and what colors and how to match them and the music we would have and the flow. And it was like kinetic art in a way because we had everything going. We had smell, we had sound, we had action, we had movement, we had, you know, how the whole thing was rotated. It was, I've only thought of this recently because I'm not particularly artistic, but I gained a certain sensitivity by listening to lenopathy. Specifically, it was a dear friend of mine and other people who are artistic. If you, if you listen to these people, they'll tell you. And this one thing I've learned about artists. They will be happy to tell you how their situation works. And if you're a good listener to artists, you'll learn something. So that, I wanted to say that. Um, last time I talked about some of the celebrities that, were, um, that I had the honor of meeting, Huey Lewis and Gloria Swanson, but I didn't have a chance to talk about them all. Taj Mahal, not the building, but the singer, was a regular customer he was in when he was in town two or three times a week. And he was a hoot. Uh, I don't know if any of you have been to his concerts or know him. Taj is very sweet. He's very cute. Um, he's actually, his parents are from Jamaica, but he was from New York. Uh, very bright guy. He went to UMass, I think. And um, I think he studied agriculture, amazing enough. And Taj, no matter what the weather, would wear the same thing every time. He would come in in shorts, an Hawaiian shirt, flip-flops, and a straw hat. It could be 30 degrees out and snowing, Taj walk. <laughs> so he'd saunter into the store, and I'd say, it's pouring rain out, Taj is, man. And he had a really deep voice, which I really do. Man, you know, I can't do it. It would hurt my throat. As deep a bass as you can get. I'm cool. So I'd say, so, Kaj, I haven't seen you in a couple weeks. Where have you been? He'd say, I got women's troubles, man. I got women's troubles. <laughs> that was his line. He was actually on tour. It was quite cute. You know, he, he was touring. But he, he made me, not made me, but he asked me to have every time, at least twice a week, two boxes of papayas and two boxes of mangoes for him. And that was Taj's thing. So I would always have four boxes when he would come in and have his name on it. And I give him a good price because you got to give Taj Mahal a good price. And he would sing for me, like Huey Lewis would sing for me. Well, I'd harmonize with Huey. I would, as poorly as I harmonize. Uh, but I would ask Taj to sing songs for me. You know, I would do that privately. So I got my own kind of, uh, you know, little, my own little tours there, so to speak. So he was a lot of fun. Speaking of people who would sing for me, uh, Misha Lutenberg, you know, Misha, he's been down here. Misha would have moved to the Bay Area found Holy Foods real quickly, and I was, as I mentioned before, I had no time. I didn't even know if I ate during the day. I mean, I barely had time to go to the men's room. But Misha would come in with his guitar, and he, he would play for me. And I would just listen to him. I was his audience. And he could go 45 minutes, an hour, and the other Baba people would be there because he'd sing Baba songs. And somehow it seemed okay, even though God knows what was happening downstairs, because he, he would do it up in the loft where the office was. And I, I mentioned this to Misha, I saw him a few, few uh, weeks ago. 
And uh, I told him I would mention that to, uh, to the audience here. And uh, so I, I proudly say Misha got a start at Holy Foods. I was his first audience. That's probably overstating it, but I'm going to take propriety over Misha at this point. Um, so that was a pleasure listening. He's not a, he's a Baba celebrity, but not a world celebrity. I remember Bill Walton from the last time I was in there. The big redhead, of course, was you know, a big hippie in those days. And I really missed Shirley, Re Shirley Austin Reeves, the Shirelle. She came in one Saturday and I was, I was working. I loved the Shirelles, first well-known women's group, and I would have definitely wanted to sing with her. Um, but sadly, she didn't come back. Um, but uh, I still remember people telling me, Alan, you missed Shirley Austin Reeves of the Shirelles on Saturday. Man, I was angry. Should have worked six days a, a week. Um, yeah, well, I'm talking about Tim Leary. <clears throat> Tim's um, kids, Tim had a flea, as I mentioned last time, to Algeria, and about, Michael Porson, the bottle lover, uh, took over kind of uh, looking after the kids. He lived next door. And Tim had two kids that I knew, Susan and Jackie. And even though they lived in the Berkeley Hills, like way far away, they would come and shop in the store at least once a week. Um, Susan was maybe a year younger than I, and Jackie was maybe two or four. Jackie was the saddest person I ever met in my life. And what made me happy was making Jackie smile a little and laugh. If Jackie had come in the store and I made him laugh, I felt like I had done a day. You know, I, Dr. Barucha stayed at our house for a week and I made Barucha laugh, which I regard as the greatest single achievement in my life. <laughs> Nothing can top that. But making Jackie Leary laugh also has touched my heart because he was so sad, probably because of his dad. Susan was utterly the opposite. She was cheerful and buoyant and she would laugh at anything. But later I heard, and you tell this to Alan Cohen when he was at our house a few years ago, that Susan committed suicide and it shocked him very badly because he knew them as little children and it upset him. He said, I knew her when she was a little girl at, you know, at Harvard and Millbrook. So I would have bet the other way. And I, I pray that Jackie's alive and he's well now. I really do. I mean, I, those two children really suffered a lot from Tim's notoriety and his uh, disrespect. And he, you know, he knew about Baba when Alan and Rick and knew about Baba. He, he knew it from the get-go. And he just chose, because of his strong personality, to reject Baba. And, and if you hear Alan's stories on it, it's quite, and Robert, when Robert was alive, we'll talk about it too. We have this tape from our group, by the way. Uh, of hours of, this, of these talks. We, we did this a few years ago. So I wanted to talk about that. Now, um, because ecology was coming in at this point, um, we also helped start the first uh, recycling center in the United States in Berkeley. And of course now recycling is mandatory. It's not even like we ever thought about it. I mean, it is. So that was a real joy. And Earth Day was, is presently coming, and the man who started Earth Day is um, Gaylord Nelson. He, the late Gaylord Nelson, he was a senator from Wisconsin. And I thought he was a great man, so I wrote to him, and he was right back to me. So we had a correspondence going. Now, I don't know if it was the staff that wrote to me or he himself. But either way, it was sweet that a United States senator, who was, I was not his constituent, you understand. I lived in California. He was in Wisconsin. I think he took Joe McCarthy's uh, seat. Uh, and I had a correspondence, and I thanked him for Earth Day. His first year was 1970, about two weeks before we opened Holy Foods. And uh, I want to give credit to him. You know, he passed a couple years ago. <coughs> well, I mentioned last time, every spiritual group in the United States came through Holy Foods. It was unbelievable. If, if you had a spiritual group, you came and shopped at Holy Foods. It was unbelievable. The Moody's would come, <laughs> God love the Moody's, and they had a farm up in Boonville, which is in Northern California. They would love bomb people, drag them out of the uh, University of California. My friend Mickey was visiting me from Philadelphia, and he was in a men's room, and some Moody's started talking to him and started telling him, how, would he want to go up to a farm? And it happened to be on the other side of Mickey, you know, in the same bathroom. Mickey was he's a real good listener, and he's, got interested in going and I had to tell them what it, what it was. What they do is they take you away and keep you there until you're zombied out. Well, they would bring food to Holy Foods and want to sell it because they'd grown all this organic food and they'd bring in like 
25 pound watermelons and say, what do you want to give me? And I go, well, all right, there's an ethical problem here. I have to pay these people a fair price. I can't cheat them because Bob is looking over my shoulder. So that was always interesting to deal with the Moody's because they didn't say I want so much per pound or so much per unit. I had to actually be honest. It really was quite a dilemma in an ironic way because I had to please Bob. I remember Adi just said to please him. Um, I had to please him. I couldn't cheat these people. Even though I knew I could have said I'll give you five cents for, you know, for a watermelon that could have gone for five dollars in those days. I can't believe the prices how cheap they were. I mean, watermelons, I was getting organic watermelons for three cents a pound. It's something for five cents a pound. Was it like a dollar fifty a pound now or something? I'm ridiculous. The food prices in those days were quite modest. So everybody had a spirit. Everybody was interested in something spiritual. Everybody in Berkeley was a seeker. Even if it was palmistry, occultism, spirituality, political stuff, all in the same body. People came in with many, many levels. You know, you had to deal with all that and more. Um, it, it was always fascinating because everybody had a story. They were all seeking in their own way something. And Baba was the one who was attracting them to come to Holy Foods. Karen and I were just in Myrtle Beach about three weeks ago, and Bruce Ecker, who was a member of our group that we haven't seen in a while, but he helped revise our bylaws just to be our president, a very prominent psychologist, when I told him I was, had given a talk, he said, I wanted to fly down from Northern California to the LA group to hear you talk. I said, you did? Why don't you just come to the house occasionally? You know, he doesn't come to our meetings. So I had a disc. I bought 30 copies of my talk, and I gave him one. And he said, holy foods meant everything to him in those days. I had no idea. He said, I'd love to come there. When I would come in there, I would see Baba, and it was wonderful. And he was so effusive, it touched my heart. I, would, I had tears in my eyes. He had never said this to me, or if he had, I certainly forgot it. To see his face as I'm sitting here now, in, in, in the original kitchen as he was telling me this, what I'm telling you now, I cannot express how deeply it touched my heart. It was really beautiful to see Bruce's face. Um, even now I'm seeing it. Fortunately, this is three weeks ago, so it's very prevalent in my mind. Um, one of the things that was um, part of my uh, assertion from there, Baba, was trying to get me on the media. I mentioned last time I, that I was on television and on the radio, and I spoke at the University of California every semester. And um, one time I got invited to a Mensa meeting. You know what Mensa is? Mensa is for people with, in Berkeley, it's not a big deal. Half the people in Berkeley could be in Mensa. You know, you have to have like a genius IQ. So they wanted to hear about natural foods, organic foods. So my friend Shannon and I went over there and we brought some food and I talked. And my opening line was, Without question, I'm the dumbest person here. <laughs> I'm the only person. They wouldn't let me in Mensa, but there I was talking. These people were so brave. They were half of them were won Nobel prizes and grew up for you know, the Pulitzer prizes. This was a crowd of like 40 people of 160 IQs. You know, I'm a smart person, but not that smart. And we're talking some serious smart, like at the Steve Berry level. See, he's left the room here at this point. So <laughs> now he won't know that I gave this enormous compliment because he. No, don't tell him. This is what happens when this Steve Berry leaves the room. He misses the important compliments. Oh, and now he's back. So, so she would have heard it. No, don't tell him. No. Yeah. So I just got a kick out of that Mensa meeting. Now, this is one of the more important and interesting things. I got invited to UC Med Center, University of California, San Francisco. This is one of the preeminent hospitals, learning hospitals in the world, like Stanford is and UCLA and that kind of thing on healing. I have hair down on my butt and a beer down to there and I'm going to UC Med Center to talk to a bunch of medical doctors about healing with my degree in history. <laughs> but to give me credit, I had read an icon on healing and sound and vibration. So I was quite prepared to give them the best I had 
from the Sufi master. And they weren't quite prepared to hear about vibration and that kind of thing. I can't remember what I talked about, but I remember a couple of them did leave the room, um, looking most perplexed, like, why is this guy sitting in front of us telling us anything? But I will say, I probably mentioned Baba's name and the importance of looking at things in a holistic way, which is true, we all know this now, and that um, I think I made some impression on some of the doctors, because remember, this is 1972 or something like that, where this kind of thinking was not at all known in the West, the idea of the spirit and the body being whole. And so, if you can make one inch of improvement in people, that's pretty good, I think. Um, I always said, incremental steps are not bad. We really were only looking to get a few vegetables in the Safeway in the long run. And right now, Walmart's the biggest purveyor of organic foods in the United States. So, yeah. And, and Safeway sells massive amounts, and I'm sure they do down here with bonds and all the stores you have here. So I think we were quite successful in that regard. But, you know, progress is slow, although we were young, so progress has to be fast when you're 20, 30, right? But as you get older, you realize that progress can come by the inch rather than the yard. Uh, you know, the organic food movement is now a $30 billion industry, and Kaiser Hospital has it. You know, their foods are organic. I have a bunch of articles stating it on and on, other than organic garden in the White House. You know? The, right. the president is why put an organic uh, garden in there. So, I give Alice Waters some credit. She never gave me any, but I give her a lot of credit for Chez Panisse, which actually sadly the front of it burned down about four weeks ago. So they're renovating. And, um, you know, but we weren't trying to take credit. We just wanted to get the job done. And, and uh, so we did it. That's what we, a bunch of hippies, you know. I, I was thinking, like, when they talk about the organic food movement and how it started, and it's all straight people now. And in the old days, it was just a bunch of long haired, granola eating Birkenstock hippies. They're talking about me literally. I was that guy. As I mentioned last time, we were the first people to sell Birkenstocks retail in the United States that I know of. And I'd hair down in there, and we sold a bunch of granola, as you can imagine. And in fact, I make granola in my. Um, oven before I started working at Darwin Cafe, that's how I got the job. So when they talk about that person, you can say, I know that person, he's my friend. <laughs> <laughs> I literally am that person, not figuratively, and I don't care, you know. I'm immune, I'm a lawyer, I'm immune to insults at this point. Um, not even so John Page could insult me anymore. Uh, 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 Fred Cat. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I have a question. Oh no, I'm sorry, if you're not finished. But... Oh, no, I'll be finished in an hour. So the, the question I had was, the current Whole Foods, is that a spin-off of Holy Foods? Or well, he probably stole the name, but we'll let him slide. No, I, I don't know the man, and I wish him all the success. But, you know, as I mentioned last time, there were two names where it's just, Holy Foods was a compromise. It was either Whole Foods or Holy H-O-L-L-Y Foods, you know. So we made Holy W-H-O-L-L-Y Foods. It was an epiphany moment for whoever thought it up. I can't remember if it was me or someone, somebody else. Day one of my partners. So I convinced 
a couple of my friends, and this guy from Sonoma County named Mark. And Mark was quite the hippie, he had a big Jew fro, and he would uh, come down and he would buy the ingredients from me and sit in my loft and uh, make these own bars. So one time, the people from Rodale Press were there, um, and they were very straight. Remember I mentioned last time Mr. Rodale took me kind of as his golden boy, and he had passed by this point, but the, the residual was still there, so the, these two fellows came in, and they'd always, they were in suits and ties, and, very, and as they came up to the loft, there was Mark sitting on the floor, bare-chested, no shoes or socks on, and shorts, and he was, the way he got rid of the pits from the, from the figs was he would take them in his mouth and bite them and spit them into a little bowl. So these guys come up, and Mark's sitting on the floor, and, and, and these two, it was Lee and uh, Marshall, yeah. And, and, and Lee and Marshall are watching Mark do this, and they call me aside, and he said, Alan, what's Mark doing? I said, he's making home bars. They said, no, we understand. He's making home bars, but what is he doing? Why is he biting the pits? I said, well, that's how he gets rid of the stems. He said, but he's using his mouth. <laughs> so this is the way it was in those days. Subsequently, Mark taught Doug Ross. Anybody know Doug Ross? He's a chiropractor from uh, Oakland. And uh, he was in Myrtle Beach with us a couple weeks ago with his son, Alex, who's coming to Bob I.S. And we were laughing about Mark took over, I mean, Doug took over from Mark, but he didn't do it that way. He actually used the scissors. It was really high technology in those days. Uh, and met the standards of the uh, health department, I'm sure, as you can imagine. How we all lived is God alone knows, only by Baba's grace did we all make it through. <laughs> and of course, we had five gallon tins of oil and honey. And the solution to the problem of, was you just put troughs on the floor so when the honey overflowed or the oil flowed, you would just you know dump it in the sink or reuse the or reuse it as the case may be, you know, the health department problems were minor incidents to us. I will say I was a very clean person. Uh, you know, I was raised that way, but uh, you know the hippie movement wasn't perfect yet. And uh, we were certainly part of it. Oh, Alan Cohen and Mersha Deduce. Well, Mersha Deduce always look, was on the lookout for um, people, people to help her, because she, you know, Baba told her she could be the, the Mersha of Sufism, but she wasn't a woman. So she was always looking for a helping hand, somebody who could add some knowledge to her situation. So there was that lady Irene Moreau in Boston, and I can't get into all of them, so, you know, anyway. And I wasn't a Sufi, but well, I took Kennedy's class twice, as I mentioned last time, it was rebuffed, uh, which is fine. Well, anyway, there's, Alan met this lady in Boston named Frances Sequoyan. Anybody call Frances Sequoyan? Okay, Steve Barry, but Frances was a psychic and quite a character. And she came out to Berkeley, and amongst the other th Many things she did, she wanted to help us overcome all the drugs we had taken, because we all had taken lots of drugs. And as I may have mentioned or not, I took about at least 50 acid for such trips in my career. And I was a very good hippie. If a drug came into Penn State, I was the guy who tried it. I was pretty risk-oriented, I guess. God only knows what was in the drug, but, uh, you know, so we're all inspired to overcome all the drugs in our system. So Francis had a foolproof idea. You would rent a jacuzzi. You know what a jacuzzi is? A whirlpool. Actually, the jacuzzis live in our neighborhood. It's a real family. They live... Yeah. I almost sued the jacuzzis once as a lawyer, but I decided not to because they're such nice people. And uh, you would sit in this jacuzzi bath for eight hours and have your friends pour water over your head. And every few hours, you would have a drink of beet and green juice and some honey. And this apparently excreted all the drugs out of your liver so that you would be overcoming drugs. This is Francis' plan. And so we did this naturally. We believed Francis because she was Alan's friend, and Alan always was pretty good. So 
um, we did this. And nobody could afford to rent a jacuzzi, so I agreed to be the renter for a month. Holy Foods would front the money, and then everybody would give me like $10 or whatever it was so we get the money back on the jacuzzi. So my turn came, and I remember sitting in my bathtub, and uh, amongst the other people that poured water over my head were Ron Ormod, you know, Ron, mustache Ron, and Ursula, you know, Ursula Reinhardt, then Ursula Hamilton, Ushie Hamilton. Ursula had taken a boatload of drugs, as you heard from her story. She and Mick, when they traveled through India and to Southeast Asia, had really taken a lot of drugs. So Ursula and I were kind of the main people for each other. And anytime we get want to get a good laugh, which is all the time, we just say, hey, remember the time I poured water over your head for eight hours? As, as the other one lay naked or sat naked in the bathtub, <laughs> you know, 40 years ago, or over 40 years ago. So I was, when I was talking to Alan Cohen a couple months ago, I was trying to get him up after he saw you guys, but it didn't work out. His wife put the kibosh on that, and no one upset the wife. Um, I said, uh, so who poured water in your head? He said, I did it to myself. I said, get out of here. You poured water in your own head for eight hours? I said, because it really got kind of dizzy at a point. So I was teasing him on that one. But the rest of it was actually shared. We would take two-hour shifts and pour on each other. This was a scene. When they say, hey, man, this was a scene. This was a scene. Some poor guy, people would come in every hour to pour water in somebody's head while he or she sat taking in the bathtub. You have to be 24 to do this. Did you show us any? Oh, yeah. Well, oh, yeah. You felt something happening. And the water turned colors you could not believe. It was very, it was very fascinating. Anyway. So that was Frances the Queen. She also told me, if you recall from last time, I had these tie dyes up on the ceiling, which I didn't like, but I agreed to the uh, other people. She told me to take them down, they attracted astral entities, which I didn't realize, but uh, it seemed good enough for me to take them down, so I did take them down, thank God. And uh, we put Bob pictures up instead. Um, oh, who knew, who, who's ever heard of Dr. Wong? Yeah. Okay, Dr. Wong. Now, let me, let me tell you who Dr. Wong was. Um, Dr. Wong was a Chinese herbalist and also a chiropractor by profession in uh, Belmont, <coughs> Belmont, California, which is between the airport and San Francisco. And when I was talking to Cohen, <clears throat> that same conversation, I said, hey, hey, you know who found Dr. Wong? He said, no. I said, I did. And he started laughing. He said, how'd you find him? I said, listen to this story. We had a bulletin board at Holy Foods, and somebody put a little note up on this bulletin board. There's all kinds of signs, you know, selling this and this, that, the other, palmistry readings, and astrology readings, and this read, you know, massage, you name it. It was like the, the world center of what was happening in the world. And there was this little note that said, Dr. Wong, and he's a quack, with a phone number. Somebody had written, he's a quack. And I thought, I don't know why I thought. I said to Shannon, I said, let's call this guy. I don't know who he is. So I called him, and he had a Chinese accent. And so she and I drove over there one Tuesday night. It's about 45 minutes at that time. It's rush hour. And we got there, and I somehow had a good, we somehow had a good feeling with him. And what he had was, he was an herbalist, and he had these Chinese herbs, and he made them into liquid, and he had bottles, and he would buy them for $20. So we bought them, and it was a week's worth of, and he would take a half a bottle a night, and then he would go back every week. So this felt great. We felt fantastic. We didn't know it was in the herbs, and he wasn't telling us. It was proprietary, I guess you would say. So I told other people, and we started getting carloads of people going down <laughs> to Dr. Long. Anybody know Steve Chef? Yeah. Okay, yeah. this is a chef. A chef would work in Holy Foods in Ambrosia, my restaurant, he would play the bell like Chev is arguably the cutest person who's ever lived, if you've met him. And God love him. He, you know, what planet Steve came from, we don't know. But, you know, I try to give him a little money. So I would drive Chev down to Dr. Wong. So one Wednesday, because we would go Tuesday night, one Wednesday, Chev came in, and he had this sad look on his face. And I said, Steve, what's wrong? And he said, uh, now, at this point, we were getting two weeks' worth 
okay? Because once a week was too much to go down there, so we're getting two weeks worth, so we're gonna come up with $40. And we're supposed to drink a half a bottle of wine in the last two weeks. Chef says, I drank it all. I said, you drank one. He says, I drank all of Dr. Wong's tea. It made me feel so good I drank the whole thing. I said, you drank two weeks worth in one night? He said, yeah. <laughs> now I don't have any more for the next 13 days. This was Chef. Good judgment, as you could tell. Well, Naturally, I told Colin about it, and he probably told Mersh to do so. The next thing you know, every Sufi in the world's gone down there to Dr. Wong, who, by the way, was a genuine healer. His chiropractic adjustments were really interesting. He was a chiropractor by, by law. He would take your neck, and this is literally, you have to watch me when I'm doing this. He would move it like this, and then like that, and you were adjusted. There was no manipulation. He merely turned your head to the left and to the right. Was, and you were, you went, oh my God, I feel fantastic. All the neck pain is gone. Well, anyway, so it got so big for Dr. Wong that he actually rented an office next to the Sufi Center in Lala Creek. And so he would schlep up from his house in San Mateo County on Saturday mornings, every Saturday, with a truckload of, of, of Dr. Wong's tea. Now you figure I would have gotten it for free for being his promoter, but he never changed the price by not, and he ended up going to Sufi plays and became real good friends with Mercer Reduce. By the way, I kind of cut out of all this in the process of stuff. And he would go over there Saturday and there'd be like dozens of Sufis pouring in and out as you picked up your Dr. Wong tea. It was more convenient than shrugging down to Belmont, I'll tell you. Um, and uh, it was quite amazing. You know, and then I guess Ivy Deuce passed away, and and I don't know what happened to Dr. Wong. You know, kind of the schism occurred, and then he eventually passed away himself. But a nice man, he was amazed by his success. He had, I mean, one day Shannon and I show up, and the next thing he knows, he's got hundreds and hundreds of Baba people drinking his tea, including Steve Shadow, who could do it all in one night. That was unbelievable. So. Um, can, can I say one thing about Dr. Wong? Yes, please. You know, uh, in Chinese medicine, you take a pulse diagnosis, and he would do these pulse diagnoses, but he, he, he remarked that really when someone walked in the room, he pretty well knew what they needed. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Medical uh, intuitive. Now, I want to say something further, and David's right. Dr. Wong, in truth, only had four varietals of the tea, okay? Uh, you just fell into one of those four categories. And he didn't modify it, nor did he change the price. It was $20 the first day and $20 the last day. But you felt really good. Yeah, he did go through the bogus appearance of doing pulses and examining you. But in truth, Dr. Wong was quite intuitive. Why did he have such a card? Dr. Wong the quack. No, he didn't have the card. Somebody had written on that. Oh. The sign was up there. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh. Yeah, because when I, I talked to this about, with my friend Shannon about this, she said, that's what somebody had written on. I didn't remember this. That's what somebody had written on, Dr. Wan. He's a quack, but he wasn't a quack because he helped all these people. Did, but, did you ever find out what he put in the drugs in that? No, there were Chinese medicines that he had proprietary rights. He got it from China. He was Chinese. You know, he was a Chinese American, but he was, I think he was born in China. So it was quite interesting. Uh, well, the, the, the other thing to mention is that he told me that basically he was using, you know, standard Chinese medicines, but he really modified them to, to suit the American physique. Exactly so, yeah. David's, David has a good memory. Did you, were you a patient, Dr. Holmes? I, I took his tea for a long time. Huh? Oh, did you? Okay, well, you can thank Shannon and me for it. Thank you. Yeah. So <laughs> nobody ever found out what was actually no. the herbs were in No, because we wouldn't know what those herbs were anyway. They were bitter. Some of them were bitter, but some were sweet. Yeah, some were bitter, some were sweet, as David took it. I don't know if anybody else here took them, but... Uh, so the thing is, did he boil them? Because how do you make syrup? He must have been... It was liquid, it wasn't syrup. Well, he must have been very busy in uh, preparing them, because herbs have to be, yeah. you know, I, I, well, I didn't ask questions. I was, sometimes in life it's good not to ask questions. It's good to just enjoy the results. You know, he, 
Early on, we got the impression he was a sincere, decent, loving guy and he knew what he was doing. And that's how Jim Long came into everybody's life and how Mayor Baba came into James Wan's life, more importantly. I'm going to tell you a really interesting story. Um, I didn't know there was an Oakless produce market for quite a while. We couldn't get entirely organic food. So I went to South San Francisco. Um, and they had a big produce market there. And you would buy stuff, and then the wholesaler would give you a bill, and you would pay it. So the first time I'm there, I find this guy who's got everything, and he would write it down, and write the prices down for crates and stuff like that. And I went to watch, he was going to do this. He would, he would go like this, and just go down his hand, and tote the bill. And I went, what are you doing? He says, I just added it up. He would literally go like that. And out of 30 items, and I'm fast at delivery. I'm like the fastest person you ever met. I could, I could divide a wholesale price and put it into a retail price and price it before you even got your Texas instrument, your calculator. Now. I mean, I could do this in my mind. I'm not bragging, I'm just saying that's how my mind works. So I checked this guy, and he was right. And then I went back to the office, and I used an actual adding machine, and I was right. And he was right. The second time I did the same thing. So he started laughing. I came back the third time. He said, you're going to do it again? I said, no. And nor am I going to check on my adding machine back in the office. This guy would just literally add, as he went down the page, 30 numbers in a row. This was phenomenal. Uh, but I did find out Oakland had a produce market. Anybody ever worked in a wholesale produce market? No? Well, this is a world unto itself. They start at midnight and get off at about 11 a.m. And it's a whole world of the most decent, hardworking, nice people. They're like a family. And even though they compete against each other, they're unbelievable. And I would call them at 4 in the morning or 4.30 in the morning. And when I got there, everything was stacked in the street with the bill. And I would bring a check and just pay them. Then I would go to like the mango and papaya place for Taj Mahal, of course. And then, you know, the fruit places like that. Um, and I had so much fun when I was doing produce, meeting the, these are the nicest people, hardest, decent people in the world. I mean, you couldn't, they couldn't lie because they're right across the street from each other. It's like a lot of families, mostly Italian, Greek, Jewish, that kind of thing. Yeah, um, ethnic groups. And uh, I think South San Francisco is like that too. So I wanted to share, that we didn't have entirely organic foods. Oh. I mentioned the Black Panthers before. Um, you know, I talked to many of the Black Panthers about Baba, as I mentioned before. And uh, so one night, well, these two nice Black Panther ladies invited me to give a talk to the kids after work. So I went over to the Black Panther National Headquarters, which was down the street. Their headquarters was in Oakland, about two feet to the north was Berkeley. They were literally at the edge of the city. And I was in there talking to the kids, there was about 30 kids, and the two women for about 45 minutes to an hour, and one of the Panthers came in, guys, and he was obviously on drugs, and he was not a happy camper. He said, what are you doing in there? I said, well, I'm talking to the kids. They invited me on Holy Foods and blah, blah, blah. And he clearly was armed and dangerous. And he's terrified, not of me, but I'm easily terrified, but he terrified the kids and the two women who invited me down. And he said, I don't want you here. And I was going to tell him he was a racist, but I thought, like, he's probably packing heat, so it's probably better. And the Panthers were not racist, per se, you know, but he didn't want a, a white person in there. And so I decided to leave for the best of everybody concerned. And the next day, I, uh, the two women who had invited me were utterly embarrassed, by the way. They were humiliated by this guy. But they were afraid of him because he was clearly violent. And you could see from his eyes he was probably on either cocaine or methamphetamine or a combination. And uh, so they came into the store and he utterly apologized to me for his uh, beyond rude behavior. But I said, it's all right, I understood. But it was really interesting. I figured if I could get the Black Panther Party into good food, that would change the black community really quickly throughout America, which changes the young white teenagers really quickly. Because the white kids follow what the black kids do. And the black kids follow what the Panthers do. I'm working through this, you know, intellectually. This is how it works. 
and maybe we can get them off drugs. And then, you know, this is the tablet mentality at this point. Like I could flip a switch and all this would occur. But that was the logic. I figured Baba put me in this place and they were there. And, you know, if the job could be done, and then I was going to be the guy to get the job done in the circumstances. You know, because not that the Panthers used drugs, they were not particularly, but you knew they were weak people like everyone else, and this guy certainly used drugs. Um, so that, that, was, that was kind of the logic of my thinking, which is, uh, oh, Adi K. Rani, I mentioned earlier, came in 1970 and he gave a talk at the prior location of Merritt College, which was not that far from Holy Cruz in Oakland. And there was this uh, black fellow named Natus. I think I mentioned him last talk, but just to recap, Natus is Satan backwards. So you got an idea of what his ego was. He was a street hustler, but he also had a natural food store in North Oakland. But he found out about Baba for me. And his girlfriend, who was a white woman named Joanne, she was even more of a street hustler than Natus was, but very deferential to him. Natus had a sense of himself as, you know, if you think you're the opposite of Satan, that leaves you as God. So, Adi's about to give his talk at Eric College, and Natus gets up on the stage and starts ranting uncontrollably about who he was. And the Bob people had to pull Natus off the stage in order to allow Adi to give his talk. And it was, it was quite amazing. Um, but Natus did something, uh, because of me, he got books from Sufism Reorient. They had Bible books. And then one day, Lud Dinful called me. Um, you know who Lud Dinful was? He was one of the preceptors of Sufism. And uh, Lud said, Alan, uh, you know this fellow? He gave his actual real name, which I didn't even know. And he said, yes. And I said, well, he has a store. And he said, you were his friend. I said, OK. We'll go that far, but you know, I didn't accommodate him because it's the nature of the political process of dealing with people. And because of that, we gave him books on credit at his store. I said, Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I said, But Lud, you didn't call me, did you? He said, No, because you know, he said you were your friend, and any friend of yours we figured was good. And I said, Oh. And, and, he, said, <laughs> and he said, Well, the thing is that uh, he's not paying us. I said, oh. <laughs> I said, well, how much does Natus owe Lud? He said, you know, we don't give credit to anybody but you. And because of you, we gave it to him. And now he owes us money. And he gave me some sum. I can't remember. It was a couple of whatever. I said, Lud, the check will be in the mail tomorrow. And he said, but Alan, sadly, because of this experience, we can't give credit to anybody else. So thereafter, Sufism, and maybe they changed this thing, but thereafter, at least for that time period, Sufism was forced to discontinue giving credit. You know, booksellers give 30 days, usually, or 10 days out of the month, or something like that. So that was another humiliating moment. And they just sadly died in the Berkeley City Jail. He went on a fast. I think last time I talked about big natives coming into my store. Turned out there was little Natus and there was big Natus, and big Natus wanted me to be his disciple so I could get the money that I was apparently earning from Holy Foods, which I never earned any money at Holy Foods, by the way, for those who are interested. Um, I, would, uh, I would work long hours, and on the weekends I would uh, rest. Sometimes I would fast for like 72 hours, and uh, I would just lay in bed and stare at the ceiling, <laughs> thinking, Baba, what do you want me to do here? And as I recovered my body and my mind, sometimes I would walk for 10 hours without talking. I would just walk into the Berkeley Hills into Tillman Park and walk from like 10 in the morning to 6 at night by myself. Uh, you know, Birkenstocks worked real well in those days. And uh, so I had a lot of energy. Sometimes I got burned out. Um, I was just trying to have enough energy to do this thing that Baba wanted me to do. Um, when I was in India in 1973, Fred Stankus and Steve Burry were there, amongst other people. First, it might have been the first time I met them, um, but at least that time. And at that time, I was uh, Michael Porson, who I mentioned earlier, was teaching all the Baba people transcendental meditation. Yeah, he was an instructor. He still does it, as far as I know. He'd go into Darshan, 
And we all had a name. And one day, about two years ago, by the way, at our house, everybody started poning up their, their mantras. And it turned out half of us had the same mantra. It was fantastic. Ah. And one of us, I think Jack refused to, Jack Warren refused to give his mantra because he promised not to give it out, which caused one great roar at the, at the dinner table, as you can imagine, because there's 12 people, 11 people were willing to give up their mantra, and Jack was holding it. He gave his word he wasn't going to break it. Anyway, I'm across the Mansari's kitchen, you know what I'm talking about, under the tin shed? Yeah. And I'm meditating, and I don't know where Fred and Steve are, they were on their own that day, I wasn't responsible. And um, all of a sudden, now remember, I'm not selling anything with sugar. That's the rule. You know, we're, we're posing sugar. And I'm sitting there with my eyes closed, and all of a sudden I hear from Maribala, buy sugar. So I figured it's my ego, and buy sugar. And it gets stronger and stronger, till everything in my mind is buy sugar. <laughs> and I'm going, mother, but I don't sell sugar. Now I'm having a discussion with the avatar here. We're debating the subject, you know, I'm not very obedient here. And now I see warehouses of sugar in my mind. I mean, acreages and acreages of sugar in my mind. But Baba, I don't buy, sh I don't sell sugar. Buy sugar. That's all he's saying is buy sugar. So finally, we have we end this discussion. I go back to the United States, and I don't know how to buy sugar. He meant sugar. So I call a broker, options broker, and the guy describes to me how you do options. You buy like a contract, and it buys his, buys warehouses. And, you know, you could buy like. But it's all leveraged. So if you buy for it to go up and it goes down, you owe thousands of dollars. But if it goes up, you can make thousands and you can split. And you can start, one becomes two, and two becomes four, and four becomes 16. And you could become a millionaire overnight. <laughs> if you're lucky. So the guy says, because you can tell I'm nervous, even though the avatar has told me to buy sugar, we'll do fake trades, okay? Now, sugar is about six cents a pound at this point. I was studying the politics of sugar. It's all controlled by the federal and the Cuba. And it's like, what is it? I don't know what's going on here. I never thought about sugar in my whole life. Well, sugar goes up a little bit. And the guy says, had you done that, and we had done this, you would have made so much money. I'm going, OK. Well, guess what happened? Two things. One, sugar went to 42 cents. Had I bought sugar, I would have been worth, and I had followed my broker's advice. About $10 million. Ooh. But guess what I didn't do? I didn't buy sugar. So I was disobedient to the avatar for, for his own reasons. I told Colin about this, which blew his mind entirely. This is not a story I didn't hold back to myself. I don't have to tell many people. Later, we bought sugar as uh, silver contracts. He had a lot of faith in me. We almost went into business together. Alan, he thought I had kind of a good touch for business. So he wanted to go to business. So we bought silver contracts. They collapsed. We lost a lot of money. <laughs> proving, proving the town the touch is perfect. <laughs> he buys when it loses. It doesn't buy when it wins. <laughs> so, so I will tell you that had I bought sugar at that time, I'd be worth about $10 million on that alone, and I wouldn't be sitting here today. I'd probably be doing something else. I could have bought John Page at Maserati, so he would have been happy. <laughs> Did you, you still can. <laughs> Did you ever have any contact with the Nation of Islam? Yeah, well, I told him about the black Muslim last time. And well, the, no, no, this local branch of the Nation of Islam is called a Black Muslim. So you never met Malcolm X? No, he was dead by then. He died oh. in 64. Oh, okay. I met the people from the Black Muslim Bakery in Oakland, which is now defunct because the people who ran it were rapists and murderers. And the politics of that in the Bay Area are quite remarkable if you want to Google that sometime. But I had it just on buying your cupcakes and breads and, and pies and stuff like that. Anyway, so. That was my uh, plight on the sugar story. Another tragic moment in Talbot's ideological stubbornness. See, the avatar wants us to listen to him, not listen to our own 
ideological principles. That's this. If you want to learn something in that story, is when he tells you to do something, you do it. Padre said, "When this is this the, with that broken finger and the, the finger in your nose, he said, this and this the, when the master told us to move a boulder, we moved a boulder. When he told us to dig a trench, we dig the trench. We didn't ask why, we just did it. So Tabo was too stupid, you know, to, to, to do what the master had asked. Oh, so, so anyway, so I sold Holy Foods and got a fair price. And as I mentioned last time, the buyer was named Meredith uh, Anderson, Meredith Anderson. And he was, a, he was a psychopathic liar. And you don't meet any of those in your life. Very charming, very brilliant. And I wasn't getting paid. He wasn't paying me. And I was in law school at this point, living on what he, I was getting, you know, monthly payment. And I couldn't afford not to get paid. My parents didn't support me. Um, and therefore, Mary had to pay me. So he owned this store, which he had bought from Herman O., which had started after the earthquake of 1906. He destroyed that store, too, going in a, a three-generation or four-generation family legacy. So I went over there. I was living in San Francisco. Um, and I went over to talk to Merritt, unannounced. I knew he was going to be there on that Saturday, and I walked in. He was always a very natty dresser. You know, he didn't like to do dirty work, which is crazy if you're on a food store. You have to do dirty work. You're endlessly dirty. You know, I mean, you're moving stuff. You got dirt on you from your vegetables. You're in a walk-in refrigerator. I mean, yeah, it's just a dirty business. It didn't, I like that. I mean, it was, it, was, it was manly work from my point of view. I was very strong at that time. And I walked in, I said, Mary, I want to talk to you. Uh, he got, he was kind of a coward, you know, psychopathic people are kind of cowardly, I found out. So we went into the back room, and he had bags, 50 pound bags of grain, legumes, grains, that, that's what they sold, they sold bulk. It's an interesting store. It wasn't quite an organic food store, but he converted it to that. But he saw, if you wanted to buy 50 pounds of split peas, he had it. And that was a place in San Francisco you went to. It was the Mission District, on Mission Street. So we both sat down, sat down, sat down on a bag of grain, or beans, or whatever it was. I said, Merrick, let me tell you something here. And I had a pencil in my hand. You, I sold you the store in good faith, and you're not paying me on time. And I didn't make excuses, you know, blah, blah. I said, I'm not interested in excuses. Let me explain to you about where I come from in Philadelphia. There's two types of people. There's Italians and Jews. I said, that's it. And you're lucky that I'm not Italian because we won't be discussing this right now. And I took the pencil and I put it and held it into the bag of grains right next to his leg. And the grains start pouring out. And then I bring it again. And I said, see, Obama gave me the opportunity to feign anger. I was angry, but I'm not a violent person at all. I will tell you, I've never hit anybody except once on a bad acid trip. But, um, well, it seemed right at the time. And, 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 and so, so Merritt, in his natty clothes, you know, his starch shirt and pressed pants, and Talbot, you know, sticking a pencil within one inch of his leg. It's not the microwave for this to be within the uh, Kind of got the message. You know? And then I get up and I said, do I make my point clear? And his eyes were like, you know, like terrorized. <coughs> he said, yes, of course. So I got paid after that until he bankrupted Holy Foods. But I, I, I wanted to tell that story because Baba gives us all kinds of emotions or play roles. Play roles. I had to do many things at Holy Foods. I had to play many. You know what it's like to hold somebody waiting for the Berkeley police to come because they stole something from you? Very, very interesting. Okay. All right. Well, I'm going to finish on Holy Foods, and then I have a few minutes more on the most important story that I've ever told. Um, is everybody good with just going a little bit longer? Yes. Yeah. Yeah? So you have, you know. Well, I, I want to finish this one story. Okay. The, what I learned at Holy Foods was I trust you every time your check clears. That... I, 
I became aware of the gross world, worked for me as a lawyer later. I learned sadly that not every hippie was honest and that um, even Baba people, this may come as no shock to you, here's my impression of Baba people's employees. Regardless of how good they were as an employee, they were probably better employees because they were Baba people than they were had they not been Baba people. That's called, what's called think praise. Okay? I'm not going to talk about anybody specifically, but I would just say not every, not every Baba person was a good employee. They did have to fire a few. And definitely not every non-Baba person was a bad employee. It was on the contrary. But I found out, you know, employing your friends is, what do you call that, the nepotism. It's a difficult path. And they expect certain things. My expectations were they were to act as an employee. You know, and it caused a lot of grief. And I understand that in retrospect. And I also learned that Baba didn't want a lot of backflack. Like, if you want the job done, you just do it. Not a lot of talk. You know, like what I just said about Padre. And, you know, the money that Mary Anderson didn't pay me, I got it back. I figured in a personal injury case that my friend Patrice, later when I was a lawyer, got me a case of her mother-in-law. And all the money to the penny for that, that, that my buyer didn't pay me, I made it back in his first big case. And I figured, Baba, or even Stephen, I, I have no anger towards Mary Anderson. So whether he's dead or alive, I've forgiven him. Yeah. So I hope Holy Foods was a benefit to society. I think we did good work. I was touched by Bruce Eckert's comments to me at the Mayor's Center the other week. I want to end on something that I've never told anybody, and um, this I regard as even more remarkable experience than the experience of Baba coming to me, nor even the one I mentioned on the airplane in 2002, um, which was quite amazing in and of itself. So I, I talk about when I was a child, when I would go to service, the end of the service, I don't know why I remember this, but it seemed to make an impression, probably because we were about to drink wine, so that was probably good. I knew when these, this prayer was being said by the rabbi that the service was over. So I'm going to read this to you and tell you where it comes from, because I had to Google this and actually find out. Uh, blessed may you be in your coming in, and blessed may you be in your going out. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine a light upon you, and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift of his countenance unto you and give you peace this day, now, and forevermore. So the first sentence, blessed may you be in your coming in, and blessed may you be in your going out, comes from Deuteronomy 28.6. It's a variation on this. May the Lord bless you and keep you, comes from Numbers 6.24 through 6.26. May the Lord make his face to shine light upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift of his countenance unto you and give you peace, also from number 6, 24 through 26. This day now and forevermore is from Psalms 12, 1 through 8. And for some reason at the age of nine, I've forgotten this prayer, which is a combination of many prayers from the Bible, the Holy Bible. And so I had to kind of do some light work on this. This took me a couple of days to figure this out. And then I realized May the Lord make his face to shine light upon you. It was a remarkable thing. And so Karen and I had gone to India from, over Christmas the last two weeks, from 2007 to 2012. And when we got back this year, she said, did you have any experiences? And I said, no. But I didn't mention that in 2010 and 11 I did. And this is that experience, which I've never told anyone. And this I regard as remarkable. I was sitting at the tomb of the avatar, and it was, as you're facing the tomb on the benches to the right, kind of where Dali says, time for prayers, and it was for morning RT, it was probably December 18th or 19th or something like that, 2010, in that time frame, and as I was staring across the people across from me, who were, a lot of them are Westerners, all of a sudden, each individual, each individual, each soul became light. And I could not see who the person was, nor what their background was, nor whether they were a man or a woman, 
or what race or height or age, they were just light. And this light was love. And this, the light that was pouring from each soul was pouring out as pure gold. I don't mean gold that we see in the world, but a gold that is transcendent of, well, I've never seen such a color. And two things were clear, that each soul had a quality and a quantity of love. The quality of love was the richness of the light and of the gold. And the quantity, although I'm not trying to measure it, but you could say somebody at 10%, somebody at 50%. And so then I thought this is remarkable, but I was staring straight ahead and I figured if I turn my head, it'll disappear, you know, that kind of thing. But I turned my head to the left, because to the right is the entrance to the tomb, and it still occurred, and even more so. And more and more persons began to pour, and I realized none of the people there were experiencing what I was. It was clear that they were unconscious. I could see this, of what I was experiencing consciously, and I was seeing, not with my eyes, but with my heart. But you say there's no eyes in your heart, but I was seeing through my heart directly. And then soon everyone there was this emanating light of the individualized soul at the quantity and quality of their station. And then a remarkable thing happened that all poured like lava into the center at the threshold of the tomb of the avatar. So this light percolated up, and then from the tomb of the avatar, Baba's light came upon this collective light of the souls at a morning RT, and then all the light poured back to each individualized soul that was sitting there, but more so, it had been, gener it had been energized by Baba's light. And I thought, well, this is a remarkable experience, and it continued the entire RT. But concurrent to that, my experience in that, I was able to deal in the physical world so that I could see with my gross eyes but the eyes of my heart at the same time. And I thought this would just end because I had to walk back to the NPR, the Karen and whoever else was with me. But it continued. So, but I was able to see people on both levels at the same time. And not only was I able to see people, but I was able to see creatures, the love of a creature, like a dog or a cow, which was not as much as a human being. And I thought, well, this will be a one-time event, but it continued throughout my entire stay there. And I thought, but in, in the scheme of things, I eventually, not the first day, but after that, my love also poured into the threshold area. This happened every day, and it was happening a lot, and I was able to kind of, this is really interesting, objectively see my own love, the quality and quantity of my own love. Um, and, and so there was like the ego of Alan watching the love. It was really fascinating. And nobody was aware of this. I was the only one. I, I could see that none of the other people there were conscious of what I was experiencing. I don't know why, I'm just telling you. I just, you have to accept. And I thought, when I go back to the West where I have this capacity, and no, I didn't. And not only worse than that, I completely forgot about it. Within about a week of returning to America, that was 2011, you know, January. So I came back the next year, 2011, Karen and I came back, and the same thing happened again. This time I knew more people. There's not that many Westerners there. And the Mercia Carol Connor had come with about 80 Sufis, so I knew more of the people. And the same thing happened. And it was remarkable. And nobody, nobody was aware of what I was experiencing. It's the same exact experience in just the next year. And I thought, well, I forget this again. You know, when I came back to, to the U.S. And I didn't. Forget it, but it didn't happen. So I thought, this year, 2012, will this happen again? That I'll be able to see this love. 
which is the light from this prayer that I just read to you, you know? It didn't happen in 2012, but I'm thinking that any experience any soul undergoes, all souls can undergo, I know that actually from my prior experiences, that it's not a reflection, clearly not a reflection on one's spiritual development. I don't think I have any particular, I, I know there's backup support for that argument, <laughs> sitting all over this room from my old friends. <laughs> I can think of many who would say that. And that, uh, you know, so I thought, where did this come from? This light of God that he reflected upon to me. And that's when I remembered this prayer from the Bible. And I thought, like, how is this connected to Holy Foods? Not directly, but when we were in Myrtle Beach, we were at Baba's house, and there was a, a Bible there, and it said, Holy Eternal Life Bible. And all of a sudden, it dawned on me that everything's connected. My whole life has been a long, long development that he's given me. Um, may the Lord make his face to shine light upon you. Be gracious unto you. So that is nine year old. Wasn't very good, but as a pupil or as a prayerful person at nine, but at the age of 66, this prayer came back to me through the grace of the avatar. I want to thank the Alec group very much for allowing me to talk twice to you. That's more than I could ever hope for. May God bless you. Thank you.